Well, Jim, after that splendid introduction, uh, which is enormously flattering, I just can't wait to hear what I'm going to say. But first of all, I'd like to pay tribute to you and the Irish Climate Science For Forum and, of course, Clintel for having arranged this series of lectures and for having allowed me in particular to give this talk on the uneconomics of net zero. Now, you've already seen the abstract. What I'm going to do here is to suggest that if we agree upon a few very simple points that are also scientifically and economically irrefutable and unchallengeable, and which, if taken together, demonstrate that it's better to do nothing at all about global warming than to trash the economies of the West in the name of saving the planet from a non-threat, then we can put before our governments a program which will enable them simply to turn 180 degrees and say, right, we've had enough of all this. And as you will see with the bottom line of this um, abstract, the conclusions are quite startling, but they are fully justifiable and will be justified as I talk. Now, there's been no global warming for eight years and five months. This is exactly the kind of information that economists who wish to represent the climate properly in their integrated assessment models, which combine the climate and economics in a single model, they don't get this information because the mainstream media won't convey it and nor will the academic world. So they're cut out from hearing any but just one narrow side of this discussion. Now, this is done in a highly organized way. The suppression of free speech in Britain, for instance, as far back as 2003, the socialist government passed a law changing the obligation of impartiality for the BBC and other broadcasters who, who were doing news and covering matters of political controversy by saying that you didn't have to be impartial anymore, you had to be duly impartial. Whereupon a few years later, very quietly and almost entirely unnoticed, the regulator, Ofcom, issued the following guidance, which you see on the screen. And they say, an example of an issue which Ofcom considers to be broadly settled is the scientific principles behind the theory of anthropogenic global warming. So that's why we get outright bias in the media, which will not represent both sides of this story at all. And of course, science and free markets and free debate and democracy cannot work for as long as that continues. So here then are a few of the main points that I think econ economists should from now on take into account when they're doing their assessments and their integrated uh, assessment models of the climate. First of all, is there a consensus about global warming and is consensus science anyway? Well, as the late Michael Crichton, whom we all miss, used to say, if it's consensus, it's not science. And if it's science, it's not consensus. Consensus isn't part of science, and it hasn't been since Aristotle 2,400 years ago made it explicit that argument from consensus was a conflation of two logical fallacies, the fallacy of headcount and the fallacy of appeal to the supposed authority of imagined experts. And as we shall see, one of the reasons why you can't rely on there being a consensus is that there actually isn't one. Here is the paper which more than any other suggested that there was a consensus. This was Cook et al. in 2013, University of Queensland, and they said 97.1% of scientists who expressed an opinion among 11,944 science papers published in the 21 years 1991 to 2011 endorsed the consensus proposition that global warming is chiefly anthropogenic. Note that that's a milk toast proposition. It doesn't say anywhere or to any degree that even if it, we, we were responsible for global warming, it's also dangerous. However, that didn't stop Mr. Obama from saying that 97% of scientists agree that global warming is real, man-made and dangerous. Similar things were said in the British Parliament about this paper. However, we came along under Lee Gates and did a paper in science education a few months later in which we refuted Cook's paper because I'd got hold of Cook's own list of how he and his co-authors had marked all of their 11,944 papers. 
of which they've marked only 65 or 0.5 percent as having explicitly endorsed the consensus proposition as they had defined it. When we read those, only 41 or 0.3 percent of the total sample had actually endorsed the consensus. So outraged was a citizen of Queensland, that he reported the matter to the police. They investigated and found that a deception had occurred and it was treated as fraud. But unfortunately, by that time, Cook had found it, shall we say, expedient to leave the country. Now, the economic benefits of CO2 enrichment are also something which economists are not being sufficiently made aware of. And if you can't put these things in your models, you can't get them right. Now, you know these points, so I'm only going to cover them very briefly. But the trees and plants biomass growth in recent decades, the net primary productivity measured by chlorophyll fluorescence seen from space, has shown a growth in that total net primary productivity, that total mass of green stuff on Earth, by 15 to 30 percent in recent decades, depending on which paper you read. Now, that has many actual benefits, not the least of which in this chart by Dr. Craig Idso is that more CO2 means better crops, an increase in crop yield in response to doubled CO2 uh, of nearly 80 percent, for instance, for carrots and turnip, turnips and around 30 or 40 percent for most other staple crops. Likewise, this is confirmed by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, Fiat Panis, Let There Be Bread. And this is the glo global land area under cereal production at the bottom there, which has not changed in 60 years. But the crop yield of that land has tripled in that time. Now, that's partly thanks to uh, artificial fertilization, but it's also partly thanks to the CO2 fertilization that Idso showed in the previous slide. So these are all benefits. Certainly, there's no evidence of harm there. And here are the annual climate related deaths over 100 years from 1920 to 2020. In the 2020 figure, the star at the bottom right of your screen now is the lowest figure in the entire period. That is, of course, because we have better warning systems, better management systems, but also because actually warmer weather is not necessarily as bad for the climate as is being suggested. And here is why it's deaths from extreme cold that are the real killers. They exceed worldwide by an order of magnitude the deaths from extreme heat. In Africa, for instance, you're 40 times more likely to die from cold than from heat. And there have been a series of papers, even in The Lancet, which is one of the cheerleaders for the global warming rubbish. But they're having to admit that it's actually cold that's the real killer. And you can see this also in this uh, report which was done for the EU commissars and they were hoping of course not to find what this shows it shows that you get a, a very much larger drop in deaths from cold than you do an increase in deaths from heat even if you assume up to 5.4 kelvin of warming over the 60 years to 2080 and here you can see the net lives saved and they grow the more the temperature grows Polar bears, likewise, are doing fine. So the idea that the natural world is going to come to harm from warmer weather is really not borne out. This is Dr. Susan Crockford's graph, and she shows that there's now something like seven times as many polar bears circulating as there were in 1945 before hunting. The real threat to the bears became regulated. Well, now, one of the things that Tom Sheehan and I and other distinguished co-authors have been looking at is an error we discovered some years ago, and we've been refining our work on this ever since. And it's an error of control theory, a branch of engineering physics, which was borrowed by James Hansen of NASA and incorporated into climatology in 1984, a, a significant year. And unfortunately, he got it wrong and everybody else got it wrong, including me in my first scientific paper on climate sensitivity. But I went back and had a look again, and it is very clear that they got it wrong. To understand the error, one needs to know that the direct warming, if you double CO2, the reference double CO2 sensitivity, RCS, is 1.2 Kelvin. And all the rest, the 2 to 5 Kelvin that they predict, is caused by feedback response, a knock-on additional warming, chiefly because warmer air can hold uh, more water vapor, and water vapor is a greenhouse gas. Now, this extra feedback response looked to me to be far 
too large, given that the climate is essentially thermostatic and therefore you wouldn't expect a very large feedback response of this kind. And so I decided to look at what a feedback loop looks like. And this is the classic diagram that actually goes back to 1926, Harold S. Black. And this is the version from Bode's uh, best-selling textbook of 1945. And you'll see it contains a lot of detail, including a gain block, as well as the feedback block, both of them being inside the feedback loop. So one of the things that we have done for the first time in the 97 years since this diagram has been in use in control theory is to simplify it as follows. To take the gain block out of the feedback loop and simply add the gain signal to the base signal and then feed it in to a single summative input output node. Then you go round following the arrows, the output signal multiplied by the feedback fraction is equal to the feedback response. And the feedback response plus the base and gain signals is equal to the output signal. And that is a great deal simpler, simpler than the formalism used by control theory, but it gives you precisely the same outputs for the same inputs and all the governing equations become much simpler. Let's put numbers on it. I got in touch with Sir John Horton in 2007. He was the first head of the IPCC science panel that produced their first assessment report. And I said to him, please could you explain why in an essentially thermostatic dynamical system, you think there'd be a very large feedback response, a priori, that seems unlikely. He said, ah, we have to go back to the temperature equilibrium in 1850, because after that, for 80 years, there was no trend in global temperature. So that was an equilibrium. It's a good point to study. And he said the direct warming coming at the top there from the pre-industrial non-condensing, that's non-water vapor greenhouse gases, was 8 Kelvin. But the total greenhouse effect, the natural greenhouse effect, was 28 Kelvin. That was the output signal. And therefore, he said, there was 20 Kelvin of feedback response. And therefore, if you go 20 over 28, you get 0 0.7 as the feedback fraction H at the bottom there. And therefore, if you take the 1.2 Kelvin RCS and divide it by 1 minus H, 1 minus 0 0.7, you get 4 Kelvin of equilibrium double CO2 sensitivity. And that's why climate science thought that there would be a feedback response of this order. Well, now let's have a look at... Uh, a, a similar approach where you start from 1850 and you look at a forcing equivalent to a doubling of CO2 after 1850. Now, Hansen in 1984 said uh, that our model yields a warming of four Celsius. That was the, uh, the output warming, the equilibrium sensitivity for double CO2. And he said this indicated a net system gain factor. He called it a feedback factor. He got muddled there of three to four. In other words, that the output signal was three or four times the input signal. Four Kelvin is three or four times 1.2 Kelvin. And he said that that um, direct input would warm the climate by 1.2, but the output would be 4, thanks to the feedback response. And if you do 2.8 over 4, once again, you get 0 0.7. And so again, 4 Kelvin of ECS. And note that that 0 0.7 compared with 1850 is exactly the same as it was in 1850. See, they're both 0 0.7. In other words, the feedback regime has not implicitly changed as far as the climate scientists are concerned, and therefore they're very happy with their 4 Kelvin of ECS or thereby. Now, the mistake they made was that they forgot the sun was shining. What you have to do is include what's called the emission or sunshine temperature, the temperature that would prevail at the surface of the Earth if there were no greenhouse gases at all in the atmosphere at the present, to that 260 Kelvin, which is the dominant signal in the entire climate system. You have to add the little 8 Kelvin of naturally driven warming from the natural greenhouse gases in 1850. That gives you 288 as your output, 268 as your input. That gives you 20 Kelvin still of feedback response. But now look what's happening happened to H, the feedback fraction. It's now 20 over 288 instead of 20 over 28. 
So it's 0.07 instead of 0.7. It's an order of magnitude smaller. So if you go 1.2 Kelvin of RCS divided by 1 minus 0.07, then you get 1.3 Kelvin of ECS instead of 3. And suddenly what might have been a drama becomes pretty much a non-event. So this is quite a large error, and it applies also in 20, if you take again a doubling of CO2 compared with 1850, you just add another 1.2 Kelvin at the top there uh, that's added on and goes in as the input. That means 289.2 Kelvin. That barely changes the 20 Kelvin of feedback response. So you still get H of 0.07 and 1.2 uh, Kelvin over 1 minus H is again 1.3 Kelvin of, of equilibrium double CO2 sensitivity. That's what they should and would have predicted had they not forgotten, in effect, that the sun was shining. Now, if we look at the system gain factors, the ratios of the equilibrium or output signal to the reference or input signal, the wrong version, which was in uh, 1850 here, 28 over 8 equals 3.5. Multiply that by 1.2 and you get about 4 Kelvin of warming per doubling of CO2, the final warming. What they should have done was to put the sunshine temperature, 260 Kelvin, top and bottom of that fraction and add it to it. So you get 288 Kelvin, which was the actual temperature in 1850, divided by 268 Kelvin, which was that part of the temperature that wasn't feedback response. That gives you a ratio of 1.075. That's your system gain factor. Multiply that by 1.2 Kelvin of RCS and you get 1.3 uh, Kelvin of ECS, so that feedback effectively makes practically no difference. It takes the, the warming from 1.2 to 1.3 Kelvin, and you could in fact leave feedback out of account altogether in looking at the tiny influences we have on climate, and you would not get much of an error if you did so. Now here are two diagrams, this for 1850 and the next one for uh, two times CO2 compared with 1850, where we compare on the left the wrong way of doing it that they've used until now, and on the right the right, right way of doing it. I'm not going to go into these in detail, but these are here so that those of you who want to understand exactly how badly they got this wrong can look at these two diagrams and weep. Well, now, why did they get it wrong? They got it wrong because in control theory, an electronic circuit for which these mathematics were originally derived, or a factory process controller, the feedback response exceeds the base signal by orders of magnitude. So you can do a differential analysis, and that's what uh, the, the, the control theory usually does. And they simply don't allow for the base signal at all in that calculation. They just look at the gain signal and the feedback response. And that's fair enough. But in climate, it's the other way about. The base signal, the 260 Kelvin emission temperature, caused by the fact that the sun is shining, like it or not, that is orders of magnitude greater than the feedback response. And therefore, you may not use differential feedback analysis. And yet differential feedback analysis is precisely what the climatologists have used. And it is this simple error that has led them to think there must be a lot of global warming rather than that there might be a lot of global warming, but that so far that doesn't seem to be what's actually happening, as we'll see later. So one final point on this, that if you work backwards from the IPCC 2021 estimate of 2 to 5 Kelvin of ECS at the top there with a central estimate of 3 Kelvin, and you then work out the feedback strengths that are implicit in that ECS, you find that the interval is only 0.23 to 0.26 watts per square meter per Kelvin, an interval of only 0 0.03 watts per square meter per Kelvin. And what that means is that we simply do not have a sufficiently well-resolved knowledge of the initial conditions that inform any of our calculations on the climate to be able to determine exactly where on that interval the feedback strength actually comes. And as you can see, if it's only 0 0.3 watts per square meter, and that gives you a 2 to 5 Kelvin range, it means that any attempt 
to try to project or predict uh, ECS by reference to feedback analysis is doomed to failure. It's no better than guesswork, but that didn't stop the IPCC in 2013 mentioning feedback more than 1,100 times. So now, how can we predict global warming? And the we can't do it by feedback, that's clear. So we've got to find a method that doesn't use feedback response. And the first of these that I'm going to give you is the energy budget method. Now, this was invented by Gregory et al. back in 2002. And the virtue of this method is that it doesn't require any knowledge of feedback strengths of any kind. And it really relies on only four or five quantities, which are relatively well constrained, or at least thought to be so. And if you take the mid-range estimates in bright blue here of these five quantities and put them into the equation in green in the middle there, then you find that yet again we get 1.3 uh, Kelvin of ECS. Now, the next thing we can do to confirm that that's right is we can look at in red the intervals, the ranges in which each of these vari variables come. And these are the officially published ranges in, in various papers. I haven't given you all the references here, but anybody who wants them, they can ask afterwards and I'll see they get it. And you can then do what's called a Monte Carlo simulation invented by Stanislaw Ulam when he was on the Manhattan Project. He was a, a wonderfully intuitive Polish-American mathematician. And in this way, we can find that sure enough, the peak of the Gaussian distribution that you get when you do this, which is slightly right skewed because of the rectangular hyperbolic response of feedback in the climate, it's still 1.3 at the peak, and the interval is 0.9 to 2 Kelvin to 95% confidence. So 1.3 again, and that's our second method, which is really a reinforcement of the first. Now, our third method is we can use observation. In 1990, scenario A is closest to obs observed outturn. There were four scenarios, A to D. But the reason why scenario A is closest is that on scenario B, the predicted annual emissions were made on the assumption that there would be no increase in those annual emissions compared with 1990. Well, this graph shows that, in fact, there's been 53% more emissions already than 1990. So scenario A is definitely the right scenario to judge the IPCC on and to use for our observational basis. Now, here we see that in scenario A, a rather useful fact uh, is, is here. It's a very good rule of thumb. They say that at mid-range, ECS is 10 times their predicted decadal warming. They predicted 0.3 Celsius per decade of warming on scenario A, and they predicted 3 Celsius of ECS, or of course, therefore, 3 CS by 2100 under scenario A, the two having approximately the same forcings. But the observed warming in the third of a century since we've been able to test this prediction has only been 0.14 Celsius per decade, which implies 1.4 Celsius of ECS. Notice that this completely different method is giving us much the same answer as we got by the previous two methods. This is known as coherence in science. And here we've already seen, of course, the corrected 1850 method. Once you correct their silly mistake of control theory, it's 1.3 Celsius. The same for double CO2 compared with 1850, it's still 1.3 Celsius. Pretty much it doesn't matter what you do. If you do it rationally, you get 1.3 Celsius of ECS, of which 0.3 Celsius has already happened this century. So there's only about one Celsius to go. And after that, the fossil fuels will have run out anyway. So how much emissions can the world abate? Let's pretend that we're so terrified of another one Celsius at most of global warming that we still think we ought to curb our emissions. Well, good luck with that. This is NOAA's graph. They are, of course, cheerleaders for the global warming nonsense. And you'll see all the way through, I've tried to use these cheerleaders, these true believers as, as our sources, because that gives you one less thing to argue with the other side about. And what you see here is that trillions have been spent and yet nothing has been gained. The increase in anthropogenic cumulative radiative forcing is being, has continued in an absolutely straight line for 30 years since they first made these predictions in 1990. Now, we can use that as the basis for a first order estimate of how much global warming we might actually succeed in preventing if we were to 
uh, change that by getting the whole world to move more or less directly, not straight to net zero, but stepwise to net zero following the green curve that comes out from the 2020 line to the 2050 line. And you'll see that that means we would abate half of the uh, next one watt per square meter that would otherwise occur. That's the red dotted line extrapolating from what we've just seen. And that would be half of the 0.4 Kelvin of warming that occurred over the period. So the global net warming stopped by 2050, if the whole world went to net zero, whatever that might cost, would be just 0.2 Kelvin. And that's quite a good and reliable first order estimate. There's not much to argue with in that. You can tweak it a little bit. You might use a different temperature data set and say it might be 0.3, but it's there or thereby. Well, now the infinitesimal effect of net zero can then be apportioned across the world, 0.2 to 0.3 Kelvin, as we've seen. The West, a bit less, the USA a bit less, the UK a bit less. For Ireland, which wouldn't fit on this slide, you just divide all the UK figures by about 10. So you can see an individual nation, unless it's as big as the US, you, the, the amount of warming you forestall is completely negligible, even if you carry on the estimate as far as 2100. Now, UAH are the emboldened figures here in red, and the paler figures in red are GIS. Uh, GIS suffers from UHI and also repeated tampering. So personally, I take UAH as the gold standard, but whichever you use, you're not going to get much in the way of global warming reduction, however much you spend on shutting down the economies of the West or even of the world. If we do a more detailed calculation here, you can see that to first order, we still get that 0.2 Kelvin forestalled by global net zero to 2050. But if you then make a proper adjustment, as one should, for the fact that the warming has only been half what they said it would be, that comes down to 0.1 Kelvin. If you then adjust that for the fact that it's only going to be the West that will do this, and they're only going to be able to abate about 30% of our emissions, you could be looking as little as 0.01 Celsius of warming prevented by any of the measures that the West may actually take by the time we get to 2050. And these numbers are entirely trivial. That's just not worth playing for. It's not worth doing any of this. But let's suppose that we still wanted to. Then there is a fundamental limit on wind and solar penetration on a given national grid, of which economists and climatologists are wholly unaware, simply because the guy who found this out, Douglas Pollock, had not previously published his results. He's now just about to publish it. And let's see what happens if you do put too much electricity on the grid. Then you have uh, what the Irish minister for this calls the Irish electricity emergency. Ireland is having to spend 400 million on jet engines, effectively gas turbines, to try and boost up the grid because power use has grown by 12% since 2015 against the EU average down 3%. Unreliables are now 42% of grid capacity in Ireland, and that was 7% in 2005. You're going to close down a large amount of your proper thermal generation in the next few years. The Corrib gas field is running out. Ireland will have to rely on more gas from their old friends in Britain. But Ireland is stupidly banning new gas exploration licenses, and it's paying a fortune every year in grid stabilization in the shape of do not generate orders or constraint capacity, capacity constraint payments. Now, this is Douglas Pollock's equation. It deserves to become as famous in the climate debate as E equals MC squared does in another area. Now, E is the excess generation on a given grid. N is the nameplate capacity that is actually installed on that grid, the nameplate capacity being the amount of generation that that installed capacity is capable of delivering in ideal weather. And then D is the mean hourly grid demand. So if you allow the nameplate capacity to exceed the grid demand, then from that moment on, you will begin to waste generation. And more importantly, uh, you will not only cost a lot of money, but you will also not succeed in, uh, in abating emissions on that grid any further once you have breached that limit. And this is an astonishing result because it's so self-evidently true, and yet nobody knew it until now. We've run around several grid authorities. They had no idea of this. And here is how many countries are already well over the limit. Germany is more or less double the limit. Spain, 50% above. Ireland, 30% above. Now you know why you're getting the problems you're getting.
If you go above that limit, you're going to get into all kinds of problems, but you will not be reducing CO2 emissions. So this is a very important, albeit very simple finding. And that's what I like about all these results. They're all simple. You can do all the calculations on the back of an envelope or with a pocket calculator. You don't need big computers or fancy scientists. You can do it yourself and see that these things are true. Now, if America, which is about halfway at the moment to its Pollock limit, were to double up on its wind and solar, how much global warming would that abate? Well, what we can say is that the percentage of the US grid emissions abated would only be about 1%, given the current mix of, of uh, backup fuels. If, on the other hand, you had gas backup only, that would go up to 12%, but only because you've replaced other fuels such as coal with gas. The advantage of gas is that its emissions are half those of coal per unit of electricity delivered, but unfortunately its price is twice as high as that of coal. So that shows you how little effect you get, even if you do put wind, windmills on up to the Pollock limit, and after that you get none at all. So if you were to go to the Pollock limit in the USA, and that's what this slide does from where we are now, you can see again the entirely trivial amounts of global warming that the USA could prevent by going up to its Pollock limit with wind and solar on the grid. It really makes no difference at all. It simply isn't worth the expense. Now, even if you wanted to do that even so, and you see how these various messages reinforce one another. You can't because the techno metals you need to reach global net zero by 2050 are altogether too scarce. We just don't have enough of them to get anywhere close to the penetration we'd need. Now, it's, the research on this has been done at the Geologian Tutkimus Keskus, which is the Finnish geological survey by Professor Simon Michaud. Now, Professor Mushel says that the techno metals required for each 15 year generation of net zero energy, energy uh, infrastructure are, as you see there, these numbers of years are multiples of the total global output of each of these metals as it was in 2019. So this is really a quite astonishing picture. You need nine and a half thousand years of lithium, 29,000 years of germanium, 67,000 years of vanadium. So you could have enough backup batteries to give you a couple of months backup in case you get a long period with no wind. So this shows that it's entirely impossible to get to net zero by using the methods they're thinking of at the moment. Lithium has already, for instance, gone up 12 fold in just the last year. And now, as you will have noticed, it's the West that is targeted selectively in having to reduce its emissions. But the net effect of that is actually to increase global emissions. And I'm going to sh show you why now. 70% uh, of all contributions to primary energy growth in 2018 were in Paris exempt nations because they are not paying any attention to the supposed climate emergency. Instead, they're building ever more coal-fired capacity so that they can accommodate the industries that we drive out with our excessive electricity prices. We'll see a bit more about that in a moment. But here is what's actually happening. This is up to 2020. It's got considerably worse since then. China, India, and Pakistan, and that sort of east, far eastern region have greatly increased, increased their coal consumption. And this was before, this graph was before China announced just earlier last year that they were going to add another 43 coal-fired power stations. They made a, uh, a more recent statement about two weeks ago that they might even double their existing entire coal-fired capacity. So many industries are now going from Western countries to China because they cannot afford to do business any longer because of the electricity prices in the West. India is also greatly increasing its coal capacity. And Pakistan, just a few days ago, announced that it was going to quadruple its entire coal-fired output. So, of course, anything we do in the West is going to be dwarfed by these much larger countries and their proposals to simply generate all the electricity that they need to take our businesses and our jobs and our wealth and generate it for themselves while we go under. And that is really what this global warming thing is all about. That's what's behind it. That's the only way any of what they're doing makes any kind of rational sense.
Well, now that we've given our economists the elementary information that they need in order to count the cost of net zero, let's just get a couple of further facts nailed down and then let's count that cost. And we can do this on the back of an envelope. First of all, we need to know for each unit of forcing that we manage to uh, abate, how much global warming will that reduce? Well, the answer, as you see here, with the actual quotes and, and page numbers from the IPCC, is three quarters of a unit. So it's not a lot. Three quarters of a Celsius per unit, I should say. Sorry. Now, McKinsey and Company, these are, again, cheerleaders for everything that's woke. They've completely abandoned any connection with uh, the free market. They say that if you were to go to net zero by 2050, that would cost you $275 trillion just in capital assets alone. If you then add the OPEX, you're looking at more like a total of $800 billion, and that would be one and a half times glo global corporate profits. That's how insane all this is. And this is almost certainly, because it's McKinsey's, a very, very radical underestimate. But let's use it anyway, because then people can't argue with us. Here is the back of the envelope calculation. As we saw earlier, a straight line to global net zero by 2050, 0.5 units. Multiply that by the final warming per unit abated, 0.75 Celsius per unit. Adjust that for the fact that warming is a lot slower than they had predicted. That gives you the final warming prevented by global net zero by yet another method. And again, it's 0.175 Celsius. That's just below 0.2 Celsius. Now divide that by the total cost of getting there and using McKinsey's radical underestimate. Then multiply by $1 billion and you get the global warming prevented for each billion dollars spent. And it's one four millionth of a Celsius degree. That's how little you get for your money. And it is the worst value for money in the entire sordid history of governmental economics and waste of taxpayers' money. And when people see this graph, it doesn't matter what side of the debate they're on. I tried this out at a, a swank meeting for hedge fund managers, all of whom were woke, and the organizers were woke at the Dorchester Hotel a few weeks ago. And the, the, they invited me and they said, we are going to show you what nonsense you're talking until I produced this slide and the whole room went quiet because they could see finally that all of this is a complete waste of time and money. Now, why does all this matter? There is a moral dimension and Tom Sheehan has been particularly keen that I should make sure that this point is made to you. Banks have been banning lending for coal-fired generation in Africa and other desperately needy countries since 2010, when a single communist front group started pressuring them to do so. And we've kept a note of which banks fell and when they fell. And the effect on Africa, for instance, can be seen in this satellite photo, which correctly shows the scale of Africa against southern Europe, a blaze of light in southern Europe on the left here. Then you've got Africa, uh, where north is on the left. And you can see there's hardly any lights on anywhere in Africa. That is the consequence of the imperialist, neo-colonialist, racialist policy that has been inflicted upon Africa at the instigation of a single communist front group. And it's time that we spoke up for the people of Africa, they should be allowed to have the cheap, affordable, easily maintaining electricity that coal-fired power gives them. So now I want to look at the harms from net zero policy, which are very real. I'm going to take the UK as the example here, because these very harms from net zero are, of course, also the benefits you get if you suddenly decide you're going to abandon it, while the Labour Party here, which is a socialist party, very close to communism, is not going to be willing to abandon it. Here, the Conservatives could turn what looks as though it's going to be a spectacular electoral defeat into a glorious victory if they just turn round 180 degrees. And I submit that the various strands of evidence, all of them simple that I have shown you here, should lead them to do so. We're going to try to see if we can achieve that. Now, one of the things that's happened is that in, in, inflation has gone up, therefore interest rates have gone up. And the main cause of that in Britain is the staggering cost of, of electricity, which is now the highest in Britain in the world, than anywhere in the world. So we would be able to help 
house owners to buy their houses if we stop the global warming nonsense. Likewise, here is a wee postmistress with her sweetie shop and post office in the village. In 2021, her electricity bill was £7,200. Big enough, you may think. In 2023, it'll be 56000 Only it won't, because she can't afford it, and she's closed. Arcelor Mittal, let's go to the big end of industry. They're shutting down blast furnaces in Bremen and in Hamburg. Why? Because they're facing a tenfold increase in gas and electricity prices. The same thing with Jingyu Steel, which is closing its two furnaces in Scunthorpe with the loss of 4,000 UK jobs, unless the UK government, which is very good at bailouts these days, gives them something to help with their tenfold increase in the energy cost. Energy is the main cause of UK corporate bankruptcies at the moment, and the rate of those bankruptcies, you won't see this reported in the mainstream media, is surpassing even the 2008 financial crisis. So here are the various constituencies that would benefit if the government stopped following the policies listed here. Everyone who uses electricity, everyone who wants cheap electricity from coal, everyone who wants to keep their gasoline vehicle, everyone who wants to keep a reasonably functional heating system in their house, and everyone who has an uninsulated house will be forced otherwise to um, no longer be allowed to sell it under the latest legislation. So these are the opportunities for parties to turn around their fortunes by just bringing this climate nonsense to the E equals N minus D. That's the end of my presentation. I'll be happy to take your questions.